Yo guys, this is Carothers, what's going on at Grinder School? Um, I'm bringing you the final part of my Series 6 Max NL by position today. Um, we're on to episode number 10. Let's make this into a little um, slideshow before we go any further. Make it look a little bit neater. So, we have covered lots of stuff in this series. Hope you've been enjoying it. Um, I've certainly had fun bringing this to you. It's been a lot of interesting topics. I believe that over the last three series, and all those episodes I've made, I feel like I've made significant progress in bringing you guys a complete sort of a complete blueprint for how to grab the basics of No Limit Hold'em in a sort of aggressive way, in my own sort of more aggressive style, I guess. And we have reached limping and completing today. And just because I tend to be fairly aggressive at the poker tables, as you may know from watching videos. Um, and just because we are tags or lags or whatnot, we're all regulars who know that raising is good and limping is bad. That doesn't mean that there is no place for limping in poker at all, or completing the small blind for that matter. But mainly, I want to focus on limping. It's often a taboo subject. It's a subject that I don't think is covered very much in poker training, on po on poker training sites, in videos, on forums. It doesn't really come up very much. But I think there are a lot of good spots for it. And even if we don't limp very much. In theory, it definitely helps our poker understanding, you know, grasping this really difficult game as, in its theory, theoretical form, it helps us to understand why it's often bad to limp in certain places and why it could be good in certain other situations and just get a sort of idea of the, the concepts that lie behind limping. So I'm going to go over that today and show you guys that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a fish if you limp. It might do if you open limp like King Jack and then just call a raise and then check fold the flop. That probably makes you a fish but there are lots of spots where you might limp and wonder if it's okay and it, often it really is fine. So I just want to go over that and maybe maybe if I'm lucky I'll get a few of you guys to start limping in the right spots and introduce it into your game a little bit because I feel like it's been phased out almost entirely by the boom of online poker and in many situations for good reason but I just want to touch on when and why we might still want to do it and brave the the risk of ridicule. So, limping and, com and completing. First, I want to lay down what I think is a really important distinction and that is the difference between limping, open limping and over limping. So on the one hand you've got open limping which just to clarify the terminology is when you put, if you, you call preflop instead of raising when no one else has put any money into the pot apart from the blinds. So if you're under the gun and you just flat call pocket kings, you've open limped. Over limping is when someone else has limped. It refers to limping behind, basically. Um, so open limping is usually thought to be bad. Over limping usually thought to be acceptable in some situations. And I'll outline why that's the case. I'm then going to move on to talk about the difference between isolating and over limping. And how do we weigh up? when to do one and when to do another. What are the factors behind that make it favourable to isolate? What are the factors behind um, overlimping? What makes it the case that it's a better spot to overlimp than to isolate? I'm um, then going to move on and talk about completing from the small blind. Some people do this too much, some people do this too little. Um, it's a leak that I've found students have become... I found in certain students that they've become really, really scared of just completing from the small blind because they've got it j drilled into them and early poker rage if you like, that they shouldn't do it very much, and they're just passing up really profitable opportunities to see flops against fish and things like that. So I'm going to focus on that for a bit. And then I want to talk about how how do we play limp pots post-flop? How do they differ from normal 2-bet, that's single raised, and 3-bet pots? And how should we how should we looking to adapt accordingly? So let's talk a little bit about over-limping, open-limping against over-limping. So open limping is usually rightly frowned upon. Why should we give up an immediate opportunity to gain initiative as well as the chance of winning blinds? And this point here, this first point, has a lot of force behind it. I think it's a very good argument. If we can put money into... Clearly if we have a hand like king-queen offsuit, we want to put money into the pot in probably all six-max positions. So <clears throat> if we're putting money into the pot, why would we not want the bonuses of just being able to pick up the blinds sometimes and not even see a flop and just pick up free money, free EV? if you like, and also give up the chance of having the initiative, being the aggressor, being able to be the one in charge of how big the pot is getting from post-flop and being able to see bet to take the pot down when both you and your opponent miss. Initiative is important in a way because <clears throat> 
let's say you have two cards and your opponent has two cards. So let's say your cards are A and B and your opponent has C and D. Very theoretical example. And let's say the flop is either going to come down containing A's and B's or it's going to contain C's and D's or it's going to contain both or it's going to contain either. So let's say the times that the flop contains only A's and B's then you're going to do well, you're going to make the best hand, you're going to probably win the pot and you might get some value depending on what if your opponent has any kind of equity at all. If the flop c comes down c containing only B's and C's, C's and D's then your opponent's the one that's going to be picking up the pot, he's the one that's made the hand and he's going to be the one in the driving seat. However, if the if it comes down um, with both A's, B's, C's and D's then in that case whoever's cards are the highest, whether A's are higher than than C's, B's higher than D's, that's going to determine who does well in the hand. Um, so that's basically a, a neutral sort of situation that depends on the actual cards in question. But when it comes down with neither A's, B's, C's nor D's, like it comes down all E's, F's, G's and H's, then in that case you're still the one that's likely going to pick up the pot because you have the initiative. And this is a very good reason for open raising and gaining the initiative rather than open limping. Also, with these reverse implied odds hands, you know, you're able to keep the pot maybe two or three way if it goes post flop at all. You're avoiding getting big l big massive family pots. I remember when I went to Vegas and for the first time and I was playing live I was completely amazed at just how many like seven and eight handed pots there were and stuff like that. And in those kind of games um, you actually do have to be careful about open raising because you can't even get the pot to yourself a lot of the time and so limping becomes starts to re-enter the picture a little bit more in, in games like that but online in a six max game it's never really going to be the case even at the lowest stakes these days you're always going to be able to to effectively isolate a couple of fish by raising your king queen under the gun so why wouldn't we do it it's basically a you know it's a free bonus getting that initiative and getting the chance of winning the blind so yeah Open limping, generally not desirable. The only time I might do it is in a quirky situation where I open limp once so people think I'm a fish then I start not playing like a fish. That's a weird strategy. Regs will quickly figure it out when their HUD tells them how you're really playing. But it can work in certain situations. It's a good trick for live more than anything. I would keep limping away from 6 max on open limping away from 6 max online cash if you can possibly help it. Unless you've got a very good reason or weird situation where you want to do it. So, over limping it's a different case altogether, and there's three reasons why. Um, when we overlimp, as opposed to open limping, our pot odds and implied odds are always better in overlimp spots. And th this reason's twofold. Like, firstly, our I mean, our pot odds are obviously better. There's more money in the pot. Our implied odds are better because, you know, there's more people in the hand that can actually make a strong hand pull slop. Therefore, it's way more likely that we get paid when we flop a set or whatnot. So. That's the first reason. The second reason is that our chance of winning the pot or avoiding multi-way pots are reduced after somebody's limped. So what that means is that it, it might make raising or isolating less profitable just because we think we're going to get a multi-way pot anyway. Maybe we don't really want that with pocket fours and um, we don't want to shovel loads of money into the pot. We'd rather just take a cheap flop and try and flop a set and then build the pot and win just as much or at least a decent amount by not having to invest as much money. So if we think that we're not going to be able to isolate anyone, we're not going to be able to get any fold equity when we miss our hand, and we have a good implied odds hand that plays well multi-way, then perhaps we'd rather just see a flop for cheap and improve our implied odds by reducing our initial investment pre-flop. And reason number three is that by overlimping, <coughs> we ensure that if no one raises behind, our implied odds hand will see a multi-way flop. So if we have a good implied uh, implied odds hand that we want to go multi-way, like we have pocket threes, the more the merrier in the pot really, as far as we're concerned. We don't we're not we're not got any special reason to isolate just one of the players with that hand. Maybe none of them are especially bad or something like that. Then we want to try and make sure that we get a multi-way pot and by raising, you know, we don't really get that luxury, we're more likely to be ending up in a either a bloated pot where we've cut our implied odds down, or we're gonna end up just in a single a heads up pot or something like that. So there are situations where we definitely want to have a multi-way flop and we grab advantage of that. If we open limp then that might not be the case. We might just limp and then it'll fold round to the blinds and the small blind will fold and the big blind will check and we'll just be heads up and you know there's not that's not really an incentive 
to limp. However, when some a couple of people have limped behind us, the pot's already growing. We really want to see a multi-way flop with an implied odds hand in that case, so it makes much more sense to be over limping. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about when is good to over limp and when is good to isolate. So, because we often have this choice, you know, we're sat there, fish limps in the cutoff, we're on the button, we have like four or five suited, and we're trying to decide whether we want to go ahead and isolate the fish, which is usually the correct play, I would say, most of the time. If you listen to my podcast and watch my video about isolating, you'll see that I'm very, very pro-isolating. This video is not at all to try and claim that limping is often better. It's usually not better. I just want to try and highlight the situations in which it might be because there are certainly times where it's better to limp. And the example hands that I've got set out in my Holder Manager replayer should illustrate that quite well, I hope. So, firstly, in favour of the op- the overlimp. Um, remember, we're always talking about overlimps from this point on, not open limps. That's why I clarified that before. Um, our hand plays very well multi-way. Um, it has good implied odds, but doesn't often flop strong hands. So it's basically one of these famous implied odds hands, like 4-5 suited or 3-3. Hands that flop either very good hands that are going to crush people multi-way, or they miss at all and they're very easy just to let go of. No set, no bet, as Dial Brunson would say, etc, etc. So that's one reason. We don't have the sort of hand that we want to necessarily force action with, isolate someone with, and then try and value down the top pair. Rather, we have a hand that's not usually going to make much, but we want to, we want a cheap flop to try and you know, strike it lucky and make a lot of money from our opponents the times we do. Another reason to overlimp instead of isolate is if isolating is made unprofitable because we have three bettors to act ahead of us and this will happen more and more as you ascend on your journey through the stakes. So let's say we have guys that are just gonna frequently punish us for isolating for isolating. Um in that case then it might still be good the times our isolate our isolation race gets through but the times it doesn't, we're just not even seeing a flop at all. Someone's three bet behind us. They've forced us to fold immediately, thereby just cutting our EV in half because there's a significant portion of the time where we don't even get to see the flop and therefore can't profitably see bet against the fish or value town them when we make our hand because we're just forced to fold too often pre-flop. And the third reason in favour of an overlimp rather than ISO is if we have very little fold equity, both pre-flop and on the flop, and maybe have little chance of isolating our target successfully. So that's kind of broken into two parts, that reason. Firstly, fold equity. Sometimes you are going to lack that. Say three stations limp and you're there with pocket fives. You're just really, or let's even say you have like jack ten suited. You can certainly isolate here, but you're going to have to make it very big with a few limpers. You're going to be bloating the pot considerably. And when you miss, this is the key part, you're not going to be able to see bet profitably because your opponent's just, or at least one of your opponents, isn't folding a lot of the time one of your opponents will not be folding. There's three of them, one of them have made a hand on most board textures a lot of the time. So your C-bets are just not getting through, therefore you're not going to be C-betting because it's just not profitable. And you don't really have a way of winning the hand in that case. And so that money you put in, all those times you miss, which might be two thirds of the time, you don't flop a strong hand, you're just going to have to surrender all that money. And this ties in with what I was saying earlier about um, <clears throat> when I first went over to Vegas. And the first few days I was there, I remember um, I remember sitting down at the poker table and I ran like God the first night, you know, I was having a few drinks, I was like chilling out and stuff, I just got there, I ran like God, won like five buy-ins or something, but then after that, the next couple of days, I started to find that I wasn't doing so well, and a lot of that was variance, but it was also the fact that I didn't have any fold equity and I was still playing like a robot online 6 max player. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd adjusted a few things, but I was isolating far, far too much and not over-limping anywhere near enough. So two people would limp, I'd pick up like ace nine suited and I would say this is an isolation hand, I would raise four or five, six times the big blind, it didn't really matter, I got called in like five spots, you know, like the blinds would both call and both the limpers would call. So I get called in four or five spots, I'd then have no fold equity on the flop, my hand wasn't even great the times I flopped top pair because it was a five way pot. I quickly realised that I couldn't keep bloating pots like this with no way of taking them down. One of the reasons that isolating in six max cash is so profitable is that usually you do get it heads up when you ISO and your C bets have a lot of fold equity and you have a lot of prospect to win the hand even when you miss. Even when the flop contains no A's or B's or C's or D's, you still take it down because your opponent has missed also. These kind of things. But when there's loads of them and you can't isolate them, effectively that's just not going to happen. I mean, this can also be the case against just one opponent. Say you're playing against just one fish, 
and he just never folds. He's a nightmare. You need a hand against him because he refuses to fold on any flop if he has even like king high. And it's just very difficult for you then to take a hand like 8-9 off suit and expect to isolate him and show a profit because you don't have fold equity. Fold equity is in some ways needed for isolation raises in a lot of cases. Unless your opponent's just so horrible that you'll make massive mistakes every time you flop a good hand. And therefore, you know, your implied odds because of that are great. That's one case where you might not need any fold equity, but usually to isolate you need fold equity. So let's quickly go over the reasons in favour of the ISO. Just to warn you, I mean a lot of these will probably be the opposite of what you've just read, but that's kind of the nature of it when you compare to contrasting concepts like overlimping and isolate. So our hand plays well, heads up. If that's the case, you know, it's flopping lots of top pairs. Um hands that are gonna do well. They're gonna have high relative hand strength in a two way pot compared to your opponent's range but not do so well in multi-way pots, so say hands like King Jack offsuit, Queen 10 offsuit, stuff like that, stuff that flops top pairs, but not the nuts, not even the best top pairs, and can be dominated, and can have reverse implied odds. This kind of hand, you want to isolate it, you don't want it going multi-way, four or five way, you want to be getting it heads up with basically one opponent, two opponents max, so your C-bets have fold equity, and you can, you can actually get value from better hands. If you're six way and you try and value bet Queen 10 on a 10xx flop, you're either going to be taking the pot down most of the time or you're going to be getting called by a better hand. Another reason to isolate is if we're confident that we can isolate our target easily without lots of calling or 3-betting behind. So we need to be confident that we don't have these regs looking to pick on our isolation raises all the time. And we also want to be confident that we're not going to have to share lots of fish with other regs by you know, isolating and then it just goes call, call, call behind. Because if that's the case, it's like my Vegas scenario. I don't have any fold equity with the ace nine suited. I have no way of winning the hand when I miss. And I'm better off just limping, taking a cheap flop, and then using my implied odds against the fish the times I actually happen to make a big hand. And not investing way more money than I need to in the process. So yeah. And the third reason is if we have fold equity pre-flop or on the flop. You know, if there's a guy limping and he's limp folding all the time pre-flop, of course you want to isolate. You're picking up like two and a half big blinds right there if he limps the cut off. You raise the button, the blinds both fold. You're picking up so much money. So, of course, fold equity even before the flop is important. On the flop it can be even better if you're playing a fit or fold opponent who just calls pre-flop, calls your big isolation raise of five times the big blind, and then just folds every time he's unimproved and misses the flop. Against this kind of guy, you know, you're just over the moon to build it up, take it down, isolate, and then see bet. So those are the factors that tie into this decision that we need to make about overlimping and isolating. I'd say, just to conclude on this slide, you want to have your basic intuition set on isolating and you want to find reasons not to do it. You don't want to be the other way around where your default is to overlimp and you want to find reasons to ISO. You'll usually have lots of reasons to ISO, even if you're not aware of them all. So look for good reasons to overlimp if you're going to deviate from that. And hopefully this will become clearer when we get to the practical side of things. Um, for now though, let's talk a little bit about completing the small blind. I think you need to be, you do need to be careful in this spot when you first learn to play poker. Um, you're generally told that you do need to take precaution in the small blind because your position is so bad and life is just so difficult for you after the flop and um, so there's no sense in completing a hand like 8-4 off suit. If you play live cast or you play a live tournament you'll find that even when the blinds are big people still can't fold in the small blind because they have some weird complex about folding when they're already like half committed or whatnot, some weird logic like that and they'll just complete like 7-4 off suit in the small blind deep into a tournament and it's ridiculous. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, you don't want to be too tight either. You do need to find some hands um, to complete and get into lots of pots with weaker players in 6 max cash. C flops when you've got a high stack to pot ratio with hands that can, you know, again are implied odds, hands that flop quite well. So look for hands basically that play well multi-way and avoid open completing. That's probably one of, I mean... I wouldn't say avoid it completely, it's just that you need a very special reason to do it, like your opponent just always raises open open completes. By that I mean just everyone else folds around to you in the small blind and you complete, you make up the big blind. In these situations, I mean, if your opponent's very predictable and very bad, like he'll always raise and then fold to a 3-bet, then limp 3-betting is obviously extremely profitable. But at these spots are few and far between. Again, avoid it and look for special reasons to do it. But keep your eyes open at the same time and as you become more alert and your poker awareness starts to grow a little bit and mature, you know, you're going to get better sense for when these spots exist, but I'd stay away from them for the most part, especially when you're a newer player. 
Um, so look to call pleat wider when known fish have entered the pot. I like to make these typos and I don't realise for some reason. I do proofread all these threads but I just don't see them. This is why when I did my dissertation I had to proofread it like five times because I just miss. Like I must be like a tenth dyslexic or something, I'm not sure. So look to complete wider when known fish have entered the pot. It makes much more sense that, you know, regs don't normally limp. But let's say there's a guy who's not that big a fish but he likes to limp. He's like one of these sort of twenty ten players that limps a certain amount of hands only and isn't terrible post sloppy, just his pre flop strategy isn't great. Against him you don't have as much incentive to complete like Jack Eight of Hearts in the small blind than you do against someone who's a horrendous fish running seventy eight five, who just plays every hand and never ever folds and makes huge mistakes post flop. The worse the players are that have limped, and the more of them that there are, the more hands you want to complete in the small blind because your implied odds are better and your price is better. So avoid completing with hands that play well heads up or have reverse implied odds. You want to be raising these ones instead, not folding them of course. So a hand like King Jack, if you get three limpers, although it's not horrible to complete here, I much prefer just making like a 6x raise. You'll probably get it heads up or you'll win the pot. It will be a large pot where you have, your hand probably has an equity edge. It dominates some of your opponent's range if he does call. And you can see bet effectively and stuff like that. You don't really want to be taking a 4 way five way flop with a hand that you can play so well by being the aggressor so these more reverse implied odds the opposite of the small pairs these big broadway hands you probably want to be raising these from the blinds even when there's from the small blind even when there's been a bunch of limpers so limped pots post flop how do they differ from your standard two bet pot um, often our opponents will be fish or stations so favor over bets when you're going for value why do you want to favor over bets because there's a much much greater necessity to build the pot in a limped pot the pot is still a baby it's very small even if you've got a three or four way pot the pot is still small um, so you want to look for a bet size that can build that pot without being absolutely ridiculous and scaring everything else off so while you don't want to bet ten dollars into a pot that's one dollar fifty you might want to bet three bucks especially if the board is wet and especially if your fish are really stationary so the wetter the board and the more hands your opponents can have on it, as well as how stationary and reluctant your opponents are to fold, these factors basically combine to make you want to make bigger and bigger overbets on the flop for value. I would say it's a leak that people have to only bet a dollar into a dollar fifty when they flop a set on six five three two tone. That board is crawling with draws, the fish are gonna love it, they're gonna call with any pair, any draw, any gut shot, any pair plus gut shot. All these hands that fish love to limp, all the suited stuff they love to flush mine with if you like. All this stuff um is not going anywhere, so why only bet two thirds of the pot? If you bet twice the pot, it probably won't matter. The other thing to remember is that fish don't really look at the bet size in relation to the pot. They will if the pot's really huge maybe and they start to feel committed, but at that stage they won't be like, oh, there's only a dollar in the pot, and he bet three dollars. He'll just, they'll just be like, well, I got a pair of sixes. I'll call three dollars. Yeah, I've, I might make a flush. Of course, I'll call three dollars. It's only three bucks. They see it as actual money. They don't see it as tokens like we do. Poker players see dollars in game, or at least good ones and non-tilted ones, see dollars in game as actual tokens to winning more tokens. You work out how many tokens you need to invest and how many tokens you'll think you'll get back you'll get back to cut things very, very blandly and simply. But that's generally how the mechanics of the game work. But fish don't really see it like that. They just say, Is this a three dollar hand? Is this a two dollar hand? You know, stuff like that. So you don't need to be afraid of overbetting in limp pots, not at all. Especially on the early streets to build the pot. At the same time you also want to be taking stabs at boards where people have likely missed. Or if you have a bit of equity yourself. What kind of flops do people miss all the time? Paired boards, dry boards, stuff like King King 3, 5, 5, 9, all this kind of stuff. It's just unlikely that people have very much on these boards, especially if they're limping hands like just random suited cards that are all over the place. It's hard to connect with these boards. Therefore, if you're like three way or whatever, you know, you can take a stab. But refrain refrain from bloating mass multi way pots too much with weaker hands or, you know, stabbing with air or really weak draws. If you've got four or five players, it's just too likely that someone has something that beats you if you don't have a very strong hand. Therefore, you want to avoid putting loads of money into the pot out of position because presumably you're going to be one in the blinds in these situations. Most of the time a limped pot occurs, you'll be in the big blind and you'll just have checked because otherwise you'll be raising or folding a lot more pre-flop. But yeah, look to stab, like just a little situation. I remember watching a video when I first started playing poker on some site and the instructor said, oh, he was reviewing one of his students' videos 
and the flop came down queen nine three rainbow and the student had king ten and he was in the big blind in a limp pot and he just let out for two thirds of the pot and the guy said that's this is a great lead this is the kind of thing that people don't do enough because you know this guy my student here he has some equity he can take down the pot a lot it's a fairly dry board that the limpers won't have too strong a hand on very often and it's just a good play and it's a play where a lot of people just routinely check and I've seen a lot of my students just check that spot without even thinking then someone will bet they'll have to fold all the others that got shut but if they just if they just lead out there they're going to take down the pot or make the nuts by the river enough of the time that it's going to be good just as much as having two overs in a gutter or two overs in a backdoor flush draw or a gut shot and two overs whatever or an open end straight draw even weakest draws like that are going to be good just to take a stab at these drier sports. If the board is wet, you probably need a stronger draw to take it too seriously. If you're six way, you can quite happily check fold a six high flush draw on a two tone board just because it's too likely your reverse implied odds are getting quite dangerous. Someone can have a bigger flush, etc. etc. So, you know, you do want to stab at some boards, but you want to avoid putting in far, putting in too much money, especially in mass multiple pots where you've got like easily dominated one pair of type hands or bad draws or easily dominated or whatever. It's way more likely in a multi-way pot and a limp pot that someone has a bigger flush draw than you than it is in like a normal race pot. The reason is that fish just love to limp lots of suited cards, suited aces, suited kings. So you're six, seven suited while it can do very well in certain situations, you know, doesn't flop such a strong draw in a multi-way pot. Um, so you do need to be more careful. That said, you know, if you can get a good price and attempt to draw out on a fish and make a bunch of money from his top pair, then you should usually still be be looking to go for that. Um, building the pot is of primary importance with a strong value hand, or even with a mediocre value hand if your opponent is a station, or if you've got a certain limper in mind that you want to target in that limped pot, who you think is just going to call all your bets and not really think twice about it, you want to just be building a pot lots. Okay. That brings us to the end of the theory. This is the end of the theory for this series. Um, sad times, but don't despair because we're moving on to some example hands, uh, which should be fun. Like sometimes I make so many videos <coughs> that I just say things. Um, things just come out of my mouth, and I just wonder, like, did you just say that because you're bored? Like, don't despair. This is coming. You sound like some kind of like horrendous, horrendous advertising guy, but. You know, please don't don't take it to heart. I think it's just my autopilot brain because I've made so many videos that likes to shoot out stuff like that. So yeah, I don't know, man. I don't. Know, I am not accountable for half the stupid shit that comes out of my mouth when I make videos. It's the poker content that I'm accountable for. That's the important stuff. Um. Okay. So we're going back in time to the realms of the second of twenty third. February American dates 2010 long time ago but yeah these hands are all basically chosen we're gonna go back in time even more now actually we're going to go back to the we're gonna go forward in time to the 4th of April 2012 we're gonna get to hand later that was the last hand basically first is this Jack Nine of Hearts one I played a lot of these hands ages ago what I did was because I don't over limp very often I wanted to find good spots where I did over limp and therefore I had to go back in time a lot. It wasn't really good for me just to look at the last six months because there weren't as much of a sample of hands where I've been over limping and to be honest I haven't had the time to grind all that much over the last six months. So yeah, had to go back in time to find the best ones of these that I think are most instructive. I'm going to go for quantity over full hand, like I don't want to say over quality, they should be good hands but I don't want to dwell on the entire hand and what happens post flop. A lot of these hands might even abruptly end pre-flop when I make it or on the flop I might just miss a flop and fold. I just want to show you guys pre-flop why I'm making my decisions. I'm trying to focus in this series on pre-flop especially as you probably noticed so there's much less emphasis on post-flop stuff than usual but I will still talk about the hand if it goes post-flop otherwise it would just be wrong. So here I over limp. I should probably just skip back a little bit to the point where I do that. <coughs> An 80-10 limps under the gun. And you might think this is the perfect player to isolate with any decent hand. Jack 9, note that this is not a hand I would usually play from the hijack. I might well fold this hand from the hijack, especially at this table where it's full of horrible opponents. One is a short stacking um, 20 big blinder back in the days when 20 big blinders shoved over your opens and made you want to hit things and like strangle your cat and stuff like that. They made you quite unhappy and thank god they don't exist anymore. 
Although maybe this guy's a fifty big he's a forty big blender actually. Oh, this is only from two thousand twelve, yeah, my bad. They wouldn't have existed at this point. It would have been a couple of years before or a year before. But you might see some of those later. Yeah, this is fifteen a limit, I forget. Because I play so much like hundred and two hundred these days I actually don't I don't take into account that I might be grinding fifty and L in these hands. So I decide to limp here because there are loads of three bearers behind me. And remember that was one of our factors before why we want to take an over limp um line instead of a an isolating iso raise line is because often we don't even get to see the flop. These guys also want a piece of this guy. They're either going to be calling a lot or they're going to be three betting. Usually one of the three bets squeezes after someone raises. Um so I just think that this is a spot where I'd rather just try to see a multiway pot with a hand that plays very well multiway. I have position on the fish. I don't want to get blown off the hand by a regular. This is one of the rare spots where I'd say an overlimp is a good bit better than a nice raids. And it's mostly due to the people behind me and not due to the nature of the fish himself. But there will come spots later where it's due to the actual nature of the fish who limps that causes us to fold. So this guy on the button decides to ISO 5x and the fish comes along. If the fish doesn't come along I think we've got a very easy fold here. We're out of position to him. He has the initiative and um, we don't really have a very strong hand to be just calling a 5 5x open even with the dead money in the pot, 5x ISO, so we'd have to fold. But when the fish comes along we have position on the fish. Um, I think it's a very easy call with a hand that plays well three way, so for sure. <clears throat> we flop the nuts, as you naturally do. Let's see what happens. Uh, we lead out here. It's unlikely that the preflop raiser is going to be c-bet in this board too light. Uh, it's way more likely that he's just going to be... I mean, I'd imagine he's probably just going to be um, giving up here when he's not hit anything. Sort of playing his hand fairly fair fold. So, fairly easy lead. He calls. Turn comes a king. Really terrible card. Makes the board way scary. He's probably going to fold to this. Yeah, what can you do? Such is life. Let's move on to the next hand. Um, here again we overlimp, again similar situation, although this time it's a little bit different. The reason that I overlimp here isn't due to um, this guy's <coughs> anyone's stats behind me, I don't have very many 3 betters. I do have a, po do I have a poster behind me, I guess he called as well. Yeah, we have a poster behind, so we have a, a limper and a poster, which makes it less likely that we can get this hand heads up. Likely this is going to be a multi-way pop when we raise, um, that's not ideal. And there's also a short stack in the big blind, who's very short and could be jamming over us. And there's also a the original limper has a jammable sort of stack size as well once we raise. So it's too likely that either we get a three, four way pot here, which isn't a bad thing. But there's no point raising here to build a pot because the fish that we're really targeting here all are very short stacked. So even in a limp pot we can still stack them should we make a big hand. We might not have very much fold equity on the flop should we raise because it goes multi-way. So the times we miss or see bets aren't going to be that effective. And the third factor is it's very likely that one of these, well it's fairly likely that we get jammed on some non-insignificant non portion of the time. So some fairly significant portion of the time we get jammed on I would say. So I think it's better to over limp, take a free flop or a cheap flop with a hand that flops very well multi-way, we might even get 5, 6 way pot, it goes 5 way, we flop the nuts because we always flop the nuts, that's just how we roll in 2011 and we lead out, let's have a look at our flop sizing, I think it might have been, yeah I guess it's fine because stacks aren't very big so 3 bucks seems about right, if stacks were bigger here I may have even over bet it being a limp pot and the turn is terrible again, yeah he's calling down and not much to see, very standard I guess in the river, he's just um, got some kind of diamond that's not good enough to stack off with. Next one, we have these two of clubs and again we overlimp. So you'll notice that I went over loads of spots where isolating, isolating was good last time, well, not last time but in episode 5 I believe, so a lot of these are spots where I limp instead and I go down that route basically. Um, okay, so here we get one limper. Again, he's a short stack. Again, I'm worried about him shoving on me. Again, I don't really need to build a pot. I've got more people ahead of me that I'm likely to get a multi-way pot. This one is closer, but when I've got a guy that's this short, and if I make it two bucks, it's not just that he might jam on me pre-flop. It's that when I miss the flop, he might just be jamming super wide, and therefore my c-bets don't work very much because he's so short. He's got a very easy jam. The stacks will be set up perfectly for him to do it. If I make this two bucks and he calls, there's gonna be four seventy five in the pot. If I bet three, he's gonna have like eight fifty behind to shove over that. It's a perfect amount. I'd have to fold every time I miss. 
um, it makes my C bets less effective. So basically, I over limp here because my fold equity is not that great. I may be getting multiple pots anyway, and I don't gain very much by isolating this guy with the awkward short stack size. If he was full stacked, I would certainly just isolate here instead. The button decides to raise. Um, he does seem like a weaker player. I don't mind a call here with all the dead money, but we are out of position. I think it's marginal. We do call, and then we end up check folding down, I believe. I think we can probably just stab that turn when he checks back. He may be playing fair or fold. I think it's bad of us not to stab that turn there with just ace high. But anyway, who cares? Well, I mean, I shouldn't say who cares. It's a terrible thing to say. God, see the stuff that comes out of my mouth. It's very important, but I guess it's not the main focus of this video. It always matters when you make mistakes in poker. Like there, it's never a case of who cares. That's called tilt. So here, um, this is the 200 NL hand from 2010. So going back in time a bit, um, the 69-16 fish in the hijack limps, and we decide to over limp. And you might be thinking, what the hell are you doing, dude? I think this is kind of interesting because I remember. This guy here, Sim Spear, being terrible. He's 63-40, highly aggressive, crazy player. He's in the small blind. My feeling is that I just want to see as many flops with him as possible. But if I start isolating, then I'm bloating a pot with an extremely weak hand. You know, we're all 100 big blinds deep. We've got two horrendous fish and one really aggro terrible fish. So if I make a hand, I'm probably going to get paid off here. I do have a suited hand that's not absolutely terrible but it's fairly bad this is definitely one of the worst hands I would ever do this with it's kind of marginal but I can see why I've done it and I don't hate it and I prefer limping to isolating I'm just wondering if I prefer folding to limping it depends exactly how bad Sim Spear is if he's seriously bad then it might be fine to just play as many pots while you have the button and we have position against him as possible. The fact that we have the button here is huge. We have position on two fish. That's a really big thing. It really increases our implied odds. And we need a lot of implied odds with a hand this week. We need to be getting paid off a lot when we make something. So after the raising happens, the, th the 3x from the small blind, it's definitely a call. We're getting far too good a price to fold, you know and for a penny and for a pound in this sort of situation because the pot odds we're getting in no way justify folding having already limped for one big blind and the flop comes 933 our crazy villain here decides to see bet we have top pair we're not going anywhere I don't think raising makes, makes very much sense unless we're like really sure he's going to spaz over it and we're going to stack off I think it's much better to leave in all his air let him bluff and just call here don't want to spend too much time on post flop um, ace of diamonds in the turn again he's crazy he has like any two cards in his range he's obviously going to bluff this card I'm going to call probably call most rivers two comes he gives me a great price I need no other reason to call I win he is king high good um, next hand if you want to go back and listen to that what I just rambled through there uh, feel free if you have any questions about that I just feel free to leave them on the thread I just kind of want to deal with all these uh, pre-flop spots because they're most important to us right now here and um, we have a 3316 who limps in the hijack and we're on the button with twos um, Again here, we're going to get multiple pots a lot. We've got another fish in the small blind. Our opponent, who knows if he's fit or fold. If he's not fit or fold, then I like a limp here. If, on the other hand, we think we can get him to fold a lot by raising, then I think it's fine. But I kind of want a multiple pot here, to be honest. I mean, this guy in the cutoff only has 50 bucks. He only has 50 big blinds. It's not really the case that um, we're too um, fascinated with just winning his stack alone. So I think... You know, I I don't know. I kind of prefer an isolation raise here. I don't think. I mean, this guy in the blind, the small blind is folded. His small blind 60%. This big blind 64%. So he's not a complete moron. He's more like a semi reg or aggro sort of stationy, fishy reg. I don't know exactly how to define him. Be somewhere in that realm. So I think this is a mistake. I think I should just isolate this spot and gain some initiative so I can just take down the pot against this one limper and get heads up quite a lot. I've got a fairly nitty player in the big blind so yeah I think this is a spot to iso rather than over limp. We flop the nuts because that's how we roll and he bets two. We raise. This raise is um, kind of unnecessary because I mean if we just call here the pot 750 he has 48 behind if he bets again, we can raise and get the rest in easily. But if he starts checking, maybe not. I guess if the pot was a bit bigger, then I really hate this. I don't mind it so much when, you know, we just have such a strong hand, though. And this guy tucked behind would fairly would quite like to come along. So 
I mean, I think we should at least raise smaller if we're going to raise there. There's no need to make it as big as 750. We can get the rest in by making it smaller than that. So I think that hand is kind of poorly played from start to finish. Bad carrots. Next hand, we have Jack 10 of the clubs. And we decide to overlimp here. Um, I guess this is another situation where our opponent just has a very unfavourable stack size. He only has 17 big blinds, so we're limping, trying to flop top pair so we can get some money from him. Trying to just flop a strong hand in a multiple pot, maybe. I think it's fine, but if we ISO, he's either going to shove now, which sucks because we have to fold, or he's going to check jam on us and loads of flops when we miss, and our C-bets are going to have no fold equity, and that sucks too. So I think that I'd like a, a raise with a hand like a stronger hand, like Ace-Jack. With Jack-10, I can I can certainly get behind this overlimp. I think there's good reasons for it. Uh, we flop the semi-nuts, which is good. He checks, we bet, and he calls. Turn comes an ace, which is a terrible card. And he jams lots of money into the pot, and we fold because he either has better two pair usually, or a random queen in his hand. So not much to do here. We we overlimp when a 46, four limps under the gun again. Note the stack size. It's a very awkward run for us to play against. This is 50 nl, but still, it's gonna be very difficult for us to do well against this stack size because we'll get jammed on a bit. And yeah, but this guy has folded to two thirds of c bets. He looks very fair to fold, so maybe I can actually get. Yeah, I think I can get behind an ISO here just because I don't think we get jammed on that much, even with the stack size against a very passive player. Um, the more passive your opponent is, the less likely you need to worry about him taking like a really aggro line against you like that. So yeah, I think um, I can raise here, but I also don't mind the limp. Our hand plays very well multi way. We've got another fish here who's likely to come along as well, so it's fine. We could go either way on this one, I think. After this 39 raises, obviously we call for implied odds, and he bets pretty big on this board. I don't like this raise. He's a very nitty player. Um, I think this is just... Unless we have a read that he's going to fold like top pair here, I think his c-bet sizing is pretty scary. The board texture is fairly scary. He's isolated, double limped pot. He's a 13-9. He's just this is just spew. I think that we have hardly any equity here. Not enough to do this with just a rubbish gut shot. And you know it seems his range is quite strong. We'd need some kind of special read that he just folds way too much to flop aggression. Otherwise, this is spew. But it used to be a fish, so what do you know? Ha! You guys were still taking poker lessons from me when I was this bad to do stuff like this back in 2010. No, I'm just kidding. Don't worry. I wasn't that bad. It just everyone makes mistakes sometimes. It's the nature of the game. You get on autopilot and you do stuff. And you review the session and you think, what the hell was I doing? It's much easier to be sat here in the analyzer's seat telling everyone what they should do. But when it comes to actually making the decisions yourself, it's a lot harder, as you guys probably know. So yeah, um, this has been a fun series. I have enjoyed making it. Um, we are pretty much at the end now. And yeah, I'm not sure where I'm going from here because I'm making this video a good bit before the series has actually ran its course on the site. So I'll be thinking about it over the following weeks. And by the time that you've watched this, I should have come up with something pretty nice to follow up with on my next series. But as always, welcome to suggestions, as I say every time. Um, all right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, comments about what you thought about this series as a whole, I really want your feedback. I want to know if you like this format with the PowerPoints. I hope you like the slides. Let me know what you thought of those. Yeah, just basically give me feedback because then I can improve myself. I'm always asking for it and I won't take it the wrong way. If there's anything you don't like um, that you think you can criticize, it's good. Constructive criticism is always nice as long as you're not an asshole about it. That's all awesome. Um, and yeah looking forward to bringing you more stuff in the future. Uh, stay tuned and good luck at the tables.